Thank you for inviting me to Russia. This is nearly 15 to 18 years ago since I was here last time. And uh, fortunately, my nose has not started to work yet, but I am uh, considering coming back with a fully alert nose. Anyway, uh, concerning the routines of the, a new routine or new urban routine or urban new routine, I am not quite sure how I will put it. But I guess in all those issues, all those topics, we need a body to perform the routine or perfor to perform the rituals or uh, whatever. A city without people is not really a city. We have an amazing uh, body, I call it the hardware. We have amazing software, I call it the senses. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, more or less rely on one sense, which is looking. Everything is about the look of. It look, she look, he look, etc., etc. The other senses are pretty much left alone, especially this is the case with the nose, the most sophisticated tool we have on the body. My background is chemistry, a PhD in chemistry from Oxford, and in addition to that, I study seven languages, linguistic and art. My background is Norway, Iceland. I'm based in Berlin. I run a research laboratory on smell and communication since the beginning of the 90s. I will take you in a small journey through the world of smell. I decided to work in the creative world, not in science world 100%, since in the creative world, it doesn't matter what you study as long as you deliver. So somehow I became a catalyst between the corporate world and the science world. The big company that support me is one of the biggest provider of smell and taste molecules in the world. And they decided to have me out there doing a different type of job. What those companies normally do is covering up, perfuming, this, this, um, the sanitizing and, and deodorizing reality. As for what I try to do is to show the same reality before they come and literally do their job. So off we go. Can I leave one note? Anyway. So I see smell a pure, invisible information about the situation you are in, the world you live in. We breathe up to 24,000 times a day. Every moment we are breathing, we inhale smell molecules from the surrounding we are in at that very moment. Even when we sleep, we smell. If your house is about to burn down, you don't wake up because of the heat. You wake up because of the smell. We move 12,7 cubic meter air every day with our system. All this smell enter our brain in two synapses. It goes immediately down to the emotion and to the subconsciousness. In humans, this happens subconsciously. In animals, it happens consciously. So what could change if one try to make smell and relate to smell and breathe consciously is what I try to do. Opala, what happened? <laughs> it's not for the vision, it's for the nose, I'm sorry. I see smell as pure information, not as a manipulation of since the beginning of the 90s, I went out in the world putting my nose first. How would it be to be a dog for a couple of years? So I put my nose into all aspects of life, micro and micro level. And I had no access to any kind of technology at that stage. I was curious, can I collect a smell, like I would collect an image or a sound? Can I build up a smell archive? Can I write a diary through smells? So this is what I did. I built up an archive consisting of 7,000 smells from reality. Every of these boxes have enough and sufficient information to let me track back to the moment in life where I found and decided to bring this smell with me. So this is my invisible diary. 
Since 2004, this company decided to invest in me, and I have access to amazing tools normally used in the industry to replicate nature. So this is the device that collects molecules from plants and turn it into synthetic version. This is my laboratorium, consisting of 3,000 individual components with what I replicate and reproduce smells from reality for different purposes. So this is me working in my lab, designing and making smell scapes. How do I work? Off I go, in the city, in the situation, re, re approaching the situation from the perspective of my nose, reassuring that the smells are part of the identity of a site, and that the smells are there not only in the morning or in the evening or in Friday instead of Saturday, but all year around, as a kind of a DNA of a situation. Reassuring that the smells are there all the time, I decide to pick and to choose which smell I want to look into, to break up in individual molecules. So these are different cities I've been looking into. This is Dubai, Kuwait, Kansas City, Istanbul, Liverpool, Kansas again, South Africa, Cape Town, Mexico City. If I'm able to collect the smell source with me, I bring it to my lab. If I'm not able to collect the source with me, I go in with the device I showed you in advance. Here, a small device, a technology that enables me to collect the smell molecules of that specific situation. It's like making an, an image of the invisible. So here, collecting molecules from different situations all over the world for different purposes. Phase three in the research is doing the analysis of the chart where the molecules are collected. This is the big lab that do that process. So this is what I get. These are the peaks of the molecules I've just been scanning. And these are the identification of the same molecules. With this kind of information, I go to chemistry and I start to reproduce smells from realities, like building up smellscapes. I'm not doing perfume, just to make that clear. There are enough people doing an excellent job in that field. I make smells. So here I'm composing and testing and fine tuning. And one smell can have up to 1,000 components. So what do I do with this project? I've done several cities. These are cities that I am in process of doing or have done already. This is the latest city I've done, which is it's Tokyo. And here, it's in form of a game. Different sides have a number. On these boxes, you have the number. I ask the people to comment on the smell and also propose or comment on where I found the smell, if the smell fits to that, part, that type of, 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 of uh, site or part of the city. All that comments and all those information I use in the next step of the research. This is another project I did in Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, and Detroit a couple of years ago. This project is about diversity and, and segregation in the Midwest of the US funded by a private science institute in Kansas City, Missouri. This is the two cities, two states, one of the projects. And these are the different devices, different tools that I give to people to get out in the city to look for smells. I made an app for smartphone, and it's, big, it's a game. For those who have a smartphone, you can buy the app or download the app at the Apple Store, and otherwise you could have an analog map. So all the area I investigated into over six years, finding permanent smells, got a map indicating where you potentially could find a smell in that specific neighborhood. Off people went to look for those smells. Whenever they found the smell, they downloaded it on the smartphone, I found it, and they contributed with language. So these people are running around in the cities visiting each other's neighborhoods, they never ever would have crossed the river 
ever before because of different issues, be it poor, be it rich, be it color, be it religion. So the headquarters showcased the research. I break down the sm smell of the city in individual smell molecules, making the invisible side of the city accessible through another perspective. So these are smells from the different neighborhoods in the city. Whenever somebody were out in the city finding smells, the nose in the middle were clicking, and the contribution of words were coming up to the right. So those ones who gained most smells and contributed with most words, in the end, got a prize. The prize was a golden nose, and it was my nose. So the real time come across also in words and sound. This guy was singing every word that people out in the city were contributing in terms of com comments to the smell of their neighborhoods. This is my first ever smellscape project, which I did two years in Berlin. And it was just on display at MoMA at the exhibition Talk to Me, uh, 2011. And it got destroyed at MoMA because MoMA don't let one smell in museums. Anyway, so these are the different elements, the different streets in Berlin that I analyzed. These are the areas, the city, the street, and the neighborhoods. This is how it looks like. It's like a message in a bottle. This is East Berlin. This is South Berlin, South and East, West, North, Northwest, Northeast, West South, North South. East, West, North, South, East, West. So this is Berlin in a bottle, and it's hardcore Berlin. It's not a perfume, it is real reality smells. And here you have it on display uh, at different occasions. And again, is the decontextualization of one important aspect, in this case of a city, that you wouldn't otherwise be interested in. And training people's awareness and curiosity about the city by doing this kind of work, people get curious and out they go to find these smells as a result of this kind of display. This is a huge project I did with Harvard GSD over eight years, developing a different tools of awareness around pollution. So this is my Mexico City. This is an exhibition at the Urban Eco uh, Ecological Urbanism, where I got an award for developing tool of awareness of pollution. This is letters, uh, 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 language, which uh, came from the project uh, by triggering people to speak about the smell of Mexico City. This is the dean at GSD, maybe you all know, but anyway, uh, I made a film showing uh, the noses smelling pollution. So it's like two 21 hours film that was shown back in Mexico City with, show, with, with Storefront Gallery a couple of years ago. Anyway, so these are different projects on the city. What do I do with this kind of research in the end of the day? Education is for me investment in the future. I work a lot with children. The issue with smell is the older you are, the more prejudices you carry with you. The earlier you can convince and influence humanity to take smell serious beyond the notion of a bad and a good smell, the better chances are that they will integrate smell in the way and the nose in the way of perceiving, understanding, and navigating in a city and in their surrounding and towards other human beings. So this is the reality. This is my version of that reality. This is another reality. This is my version of that reality. This kind of reality I give to children and children are playing with pollution. Normally, you will just ignore the image. Here, they take pollution serious. They come up with new solutions, a new approach, what to do with those kind of issues. We are tired of looking at melting ice poles at TV. When you smell that the ice bear is hungry, you probably will react according to your, what you understand. So city smellscape workshops is a very essential part of my work. Since four years, I do the World Science Festival in New York with NYU and Columbia University, setting up smell labs at Washington Square Garden, tracking smells in Chinatown and the surrounding, and letting kids smell their city. The astonishing part here is that these kids cannot get enough. The more rough and the more real the smells are, the more fun the kids have. 
And that is not only the case with the kids. This is also the same for Mercedes, Mercedes CEOs. When they do workshop with managers, they become children. Nose is the best way to become a child again. So these kids are smelling pollution, garbage, you name it, I say it. Parents are far away because as soon as they come across, you get the notion of don't smell this, don't do this. So the kids are having a lot of fun using their alert senses and trying to understand the reality they are approaching with all their senses, the whole metabolism. So these are workshops across the US, 250 schools I did in six, in six months. And this is uh, language and smell workshops. And it's so much fun and so much material. And I be build up a database from all these results, which are then used further on. And now we are developing smell devices technology for the same purposes. So these kids are smelling and enjoying. This sewage plant is made by a disabled child that never ever made a drawing, never ever said a word. This is his teacher that called it sewage, but the drawing is clear enough, I think. This is the first ever flower made by this boy. Another uh, group of work that I'm pretty famous for is uh, not only the micro world, but the macro world. And the, these are the body smell projects I've been doing for several years, commissioned by MIT in 2006. And I got access to uh, 21 men that suffer serious from phobia towards other human beings. And this was during the Bush government and the whole notion around terrorism in the US. So I was curious, can I smell that somebody is afraid? So I started this project with support from a lot of sci sci scientists, and psychiatrists, psychologists at Harvard and MIT. And I tracked body sweat at the moment of a fair attack, I turn it into a micro-encapsulated sweat we produced, and the technology is amazing. I have a patent on this technology. You literally touch the wall, and the wall is breathing, and you touch the wall, and it gives off a body sweat. So the wall became a metaphor of a skin. And this is the Beijing Olympics, which I did then together with Tsinghua University. Here you had 21 guys lined up, and the reaction all over the world has been amazing. In China, people couldn't get enough. In the US, people were throwing up. So again, showing that smell is very cultural, and people have a completely different reaction. But nevertheless, they have reaction in all cases. It's quick. Smell is very precise. This woman, she couldn't believe she could smell the guy all over the place. So body smell workshop, always a part of my work is doing workshop. This is the Harvard Business School. <laughs> I develop a, a fabric together with NASA, and I collect all the bacteria, all the smell on your body. And these students were asked to comment on each other's body smell. We uh, have a unique body smell, as unique as our fingerprint. We hardly have time to find out here is another occasion where I place myself to speak about body sweat. <clears throat> the fear of smell, the smell of fear. And this is simulated body sweat. Here you can touch guy number eight. You can wash yourself with guy number five. And here you have an invisible magazine with invisible portraits of cities and humans. Another situation uh, uh, which I had a very interesting experience was at MoMA San Francisco, they made the first ever exhibition on when wine became modern. This is the bottle of wine I got to my disposal. I didn't get interest because it was vintage and very expensive. I got interest because it had amazing wine inside. So I set up drinking this wine for seven hours. The bottle cost $5,000. I didn't get drunken, but I got, I collapsed afterward. <laughs> So this is the wine in my mouth. I reproduce the smell of wine in my system. And this is how it looked like at MoMA San Francisco. I made a hole in the wall. The technology I used is like you breathe on the surface of my abstract mouth, and I breathe back on you. And the piece is permanent, so there's hope in the world. This museum had the guts to get the piece for their collection, compared to MoMA New York, who were afraid to let people smell. So 
This is another project I'm involved with at the moment. Uh, on behalf of all the body bacteria, body smells I've done, we all know that if you are a human and you smell, it's not necessarily a compliment. But if you are a cheese and you smell, it's really a compliment. So I was paired with microbiologists, synthetic biologists at Harvard Medical School for a resident for half a year to look into what is life, real life and synthetic life. And as we know, bacteria are all over the place on the body. And the more we have, the more happy we are. Fortunately, not everybody believes in this. We live in a world where antibiotica is the most, most popular drug in food and in medication. By having taken in so much antibiotica through generations, we are suffering, the body is suffering, the stomach is suffering, our kids are getting allergic, etc. Finally, science is starting to see the necessity of having a discourse around bacteria and also a little bit less sanitized, deodorized, and pasteurized, for God's sake. So here we sequence cheese, we find amazing bacteria, and we started to compare these bacteria. And you might now have a fantasy enough to where I'm heading. Anyway, so here we are growing human bacteria in the incubator overnight and ask different celebrities to donate ours, us their favorite human bacteria for the purpose to make cheese out of it. In other words, to visualize the invisible again, which is my topic of concern. So here I have a very sophisticated cheese. Here you have Mark Zuckerberg cheese. I think he gave me his uh, armpit. This is Jürgen Mayer, an architect from Berlin. He gave me his ears. Hans Ulrich Obrich gave me his forehead. Olaf Eliasson gave me his tears. Michael Pollan, the New York Times food critic, gave me his foot. Bill Gates gave me his nose. Inga Dragset gave me his cheeks. And uh, Adidas is another client who thinks that I am cool and smart and would like to experience something else with their products and with their sports people. So during the Olympics in London, I got access to David Beckham's dirty sneakers, upper for recirculation and rituals and routines. So here I analyzed the, 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 the sneakers and found amazing bacteria that cause specific smells that I also find in this cheese. Here I make cheese out of David Beckham's recirculated sneakers and uh, we served it at the VIP lounge at Adidas in London. Food for stars, for uh, uh, five stars, four stars, doesn't exist in Michelin. Here I made a new application for digesting food, a big table looking like a house. You open the table and you have four reasons for eating without food. So we have a whole meal in a tablet, you have a whole meal in a bottle, and these are clients that think innovation is important, that changing the way we see, the way we digest, the way we perceive, and the which kind of rituals we have, maybe for the better for the world and for oneself. My last chapter is smell and memory. As we all know, smell memory is very efficient. 100% remain after one year of smell memory. 30% remain after three months of visual memory. So why not use this? Before rendering and computing and any kind of digital uh, way of rendering information existed, scientists remember hardcore information always in the context of a smell. And to recall what they remember, they use a smell that they, they in the context, the same smell that they used in the context of when they learned about it. So here are a couple of, oops, what happened? Last. Last? No, last chapter.
So in addition to copying reality smells, I look into individual smell molecules, meaning 3,000 individual abstract smell components that normally are used to make abstract slurries, perfume, 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 purpose, perfume, detergent, you name it, I say it, abstract smell. So how can this component be used for other purposes? And what I'm doing here is, for example, we have gas. Gas don't smell. In the 20s, three molecules was put on the top of gas to make it perceivable, meaning smell codes what given. So this project here was done with Lund University. What could happen if we listen to news in the context of a smell? 398 abstract smell molecules had 398 codes. The software, con the news condensed down, the software enabled the news to condense down to a code. The code activated the molecule, and you listen to the news in the context of an abstract smell. And we were testing how much of the news do you remember in the context of a smell and how much not. And it was astonishing a lot. Another sample of uh, memory and smell is the Serpentine Gallery in London. Uh, the pavilion of Ai Weiwei, Herzog and Dumera, was all about the memory of the memory. So the whole pavilion had elements from the old previous pavilions, and they commissioned me to make the memory of the memory of the memory. So I tracked down all the different smells I could find in this context and turn it into a smell of the memory of the memory of the memory. So the pavilion is gone, but the smell of it exists forever and is part of the collection of the, mem of the, of the Serpentine Gallery. So this is the last project I'm going to show, which is another coding system. I was commissioned by the German government to do a project for the first ever reopened new um, German his uh, military history museum in Dresden. They decided to reinterpret and rewrite the German army history, and not only uh, intellectually, but also physically. So they hired Daniel Liebeskin to cut this classicistic building in two, which is normally completely forbidden. It's a monumental building. So they really want to show the world we want to change. And they commissioned me to make the smell of World War I. And in this case, you smell a hardcore smell, which immediately makes you vomit. So, in the beginning, we didn't think about people would vomit so quick, so we <coughs> people couldn't make it to the toilet, and they had big problems. So now we have next to the door, so people can vomit immediately. And the problem with making this smell was that they couldn't get it bad enough, you know, because there are no ultima, there are no global smell for stench. There are no. Uh, I had no references how it was smelling at the battlefields in Vendor. So in other words, I composed a disgusting smell that I kind of imagined could be the situation. In other words, I gave the smell, the World War I, a code, a smell code. And the fun thing is, my daughter, she's 15, and her, all her friends, I work at home, I have a huge laboratorium. Whenever they smell, they smell again. Now, they say, oh, World War I. So the reference is already there. So what do I do with that type of project? I am developing different abstract smell molecules for learning. So these kids are learning mathematics in a context of a smell. And to recall what they learned, they pick up the smell a couple of days or maybe a week later. And the efficiency of that methodology of learning is amazing. It costs no money, a little bit of reprogramming your brain and your nose, and you have amazing tools, which is the most efficient in a most efficient way. Thank you very much. This is my small introduction. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that today uh, our guest received a, a message that she, she was just shortlisted for the uh, Woman of the Year uh, award in, in, in the U.S. So, um, in science. yeah, in science, in, in, in science and moreover in innovation. So I guess we will be 
crossing our fingers for you. Um, so, um, I have some questions, but you guys please join me uh, and ask questions directly. Uh, I can also translate if, if it's needed. Um, I started uh, scenography, or if you want, stage design at the Moscow Art Theater. And uh, one of our key disciplines was, of course, uh, history of costume design. And the main source uh, of studies in this discipline is, of course, old paintings. So if you look, for example, at the 16th century German painting by, say, Hans Holbein or Lukas Kranach, uh, and you study costumes of, of his personages, especially if, if it's a private portrait, but sometimes also in the in a bigger religious scenes, you would notice that very often the characters have strange bottles, or you can't even call them bottles. These are more like vessels attached to their waists or or to their belts, and basically these these were bottles where they had sometimes perfumes, but sometimes other very strong smells, uh, just for one reason, because people rarely washed. So their bodily odor was awful, and they used strong smell just to mask, yeah, or somehow shield their own bodily odor. And very often they used, for example, rotten fish, just to, you know, to screen your own bodily smell. Or rotten meat, uh, there are all kinds of things. So the, the strong smell was already enough. So my question to you is, how different are we from, from say, Germans of the 16th century? Like, wh how, because it seems like their perception of smells was, was pretty different from ours. They were probably used to a very different palette you know the, the quote um, from Napoleon, yeah? Please don't wash, I'm on my way. Ah, this was to his <laughs> wife, right? Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I would have loved to live those days. I mean, it was for me, for me, it would oh, be this, the, this was heaven. your world, actually. Uh, that would be my heaven, yes. I, I miss it. I guess I miss that train, you know? But um, I'm doing my best to repair it, yeah? The fact is that we are born with a deodorant in our hands is a shame. You know, we don't have a chance to find out who we are beyond the way we look and partly also the way we sound. But there's nowhere you can find out that you have a unique smell as unique as your fingerprint. I think that's a pity, you know. And since science is so, f so far that we have the, 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 the ability to know that, you know, that's, that's the difference between those days where they didn't know it, you know. So if they would have known that that unique smell that you pro project actually is a quality, you know, rather than, you know. Right. Yeah, but what do we do now to, to leave your way, so to speak? Because it seems like we need quite a lot of schooling then, or... Like, I cannot imagine sitting next to someone in a library who, who Why doesn't not? use deodorant. Yeah. Why not? When I did my project it's at MIT... Yeah. Or how should I put no, it? No, but listen, I think for the moment, I mean, New York Times had recently a couple of pages on, the, on the deodorization. You know, wash less, you know, be yourself, use less, you know, perfume, soaps, etc. It's not about being clean or not. It's about camouflaging maybe important aspect of you which you know in the end will be uniform you know and you don't you don't smell different than anybody else is that uh, the aim of everything you know it is kind of you know but when i did my mit project there was um, a previous uh, professor at harvard that decided that he wanted to change his life change his routines so he started to live on the street Nevertheless, he didn't stop reading, so he continued to, to use the public library. But his body odor was obviously extreme. So he one day got denied entering the library, and he sued them. And he won the case, because they, what is a bad smell and what is a good smell, you know? They couldn't measure these things. It's not like with sound, you can measure in decibel, you know? So the whole discussion, this is good and this is bad, is, I think, pretty much cliche, you know? 
primarily set these rules are set by the commercial world to send to sell perfume, to sell deodorant, to sell detergent, to sell but cleaning. But, but stuff. excuse me, may I uh, interrupt you? Because I always thought that it was sort of uh, defense of our body. Mm -hmm. uh, when you react or say of, uh, to the stench of the rotten flesh, so the body signals you that you shouldn't go there. So basically, yeah, you difference. you stay you that's stay away. And that's maybe a difference. If it's rotten, then you better stay away. That's not what I speak about. So I I imagine that um, all our olfactory reactions are derived from this kind of protection, uh, protection yes. or safety, all kinds of. Yes, but that's a different, a different issue, you know, that's a physical reaction, you yeah, not a psychological reaction. So if you react to a smell, it's not because of the smell is bad or good, it's because it's, you physically react and you're supposed to react. That's a natural, natural reaction. Humans next to cockroaches and rats are the biggest generalists on planet Earth. The nose is there to find food and partner. That's it. And whatever you come across as food or partner, it doesn't matter, you consume it, you know? And somehow we, we tend to have forgotten this. And I don't speak about danger in situations where, where poison is happening, your reaction physically, and it's completely different discussion. So that's not what I say, you should go into a situation where you get poisoned. That is a different issue. Right. Um, can we introduce some of the smells that you brought with oh, you yes. today? Um, yeah. Right. So, what are the? So, we will be distributing those uh, those little pieces of what is it? Paper? Is it paper or special yes. plastic yes, or it's a, a paper? It's a, it's a paper. And yeah. and what? This is the smell of what? Of whom? These are different different smells on different projects I've done. Different city smells, different body smells, different. So, yeah. number one is what? No, I'm not going to say anything. Ah, you're not going to say no. anything? No, people can uh, so suggest let's themselves. Let's hope that no one what, what's overreacts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to smell on the, on the skinniest part. May I, have one, may I have one as well? There are 10 different smells. Thank you. So you have to smell on the thinnest, skinniest. Huh? I don't know which one you're smelling. Oh, this is uh, okay. interesting. <laughs> anyway, we can continue conversation and then. Huh? Sorry? Is, is it oh. blood? The question from the audience is it blood? <laughs> yes, I just killed somebody down the street. <laughs> no, but seriously, what? Oh, it's, uh, it gives me like a bit of a vertigo. What is it? Is it blood? Yeah, it's blood. <laughs> yeah. But please, can you just deliver all the different ones? It's. I know. Oh. No, but actually, no, it's not that bad. It's just very strong. Oh yeah. <coughs> That's uh, David Beckham's sneaker. Cheese. Yes. Oh, guys, this is like this is Take this is it. gruesome. Take care of this one. The second one. This this is number two. Yeah, but everybody have different numbers. Ah, okay. I, I, they were supposed to do it systematically, but that. Ah. Hmm. Oh, this is gross. Yeah, I think we probably cannot talk to you without asking about the novel by Patrick Zuskin, the mm -hmm. perfume, the, the story of the murder, because it seems like this was the, the wake up call for, for the humanity. Oh, we, we can smell, we can enjoy smells, or we can, I yeah, we. we book. I never read the book, I never, never saw the film, yeah. but I consulted the, the film. Ah, uh, you consulted yes. the film. But my take on it was we should have the real smells on stage and make the actor react in according to what they smell, but that was not so popular. Yeah, so yeah. my question to you, because of course when you are not a specialist in smells, uh, you cannot really uh, understand whether it's true or not, because the, the main character, he can even yeah. smell 
uh, without any special devices. He can smell glass, mm -hmm. he can smell metal, he can smell stones, different types of stones. Is it possible? I mean, you cannot, th those are hard materials. Those are hard materials you cannot smell unless there is a patina on it. You know, if the stones have moss, if the, if the iron have a you know, patina, of course, oxidation can smell. But not per se. Glass don't smell, shouldn't smell. Water don't smell, shouldn't smell. It smells very often, but <laughs> should not smell. Right. Yeah. So, so it if it smells, indicating that is some substance in there which, you know, maybe shouldn't be there. Yeah. yeah so it's fiction. I thought so. <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it I was got a, a, It was an exaggeration. Oh, I sorry. was. Uh, I was uh, asked by Swarovski if I could make the smell of uh, crystals. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you you said very uh, with a, with an emphasis that you don't do perfumes, mm -hmm. but how in fact different are your two worlds? Because uh, for us, like the profane public, we we don't understand. Like for me, it's more or less the same. They of course recreate more pleasant smells from from nature. You work from with very different smells, mm -hmm. including pleasant and unpleasant. So, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's more or less the same. So, how do you see the difference? Um, in the case, I mean, the knowledge is the same, the base is the same, the components are more or less the same. So the purpose with this kind of knowledge has, through years, been to cover up reality. Like you said, with the, with the camouflaging, uh, like body smells or, or any kind of smell in your surrounding. Uh, the way these products are made is primarily uh, making abstract slurries, yeah? That mm -hmm. doesn't have a necessarily a real smell, but it's like a jazz, you know, improvisation on a team. Yeah, it's like Im improvisation on the topics, like polo blue. What does it mean? Yeah, Chanel number no. five. What does it mean? You know, it's it's a composition, it's a bouquet of of uh, some molecules or some ingredients, partly or some naturals. As for what I do, I really try to copy to scientifically look into. A smell break down the components of a smell and look into individual components and copy it to chemical components. Right. And my smells are never meant to be put on the body. My smells are there, purpose, information, uh -huh. rather than consumation. Yes. Yeah. But and also the way of working is completely different. Yeah. I I am dependent of the, my devices to collect the molecules. Yeah. If somebody come to me and I'm a perfumer, they say, please make the smell of Moscow. I would sit down, I was like vodka, maybe a little bit, you know, a little <laughs> bit this, or a little bit chocolate from the, the whatever, you know, a bit the, the river, and, and pretend I know, and my improvis like my, my uh, um, kind of abstract imagination or yeah, improvisation of, yeah? So, um, but if I should go in and do it the way I do it, I will pick all these elements and analyze them. All the right. vodka, the chocolate, the river, the church, the whatever, yeah? And come up with, with scans like you saw on the slides. Yeah. Break down the molecules and then take the main molecules and copy and then build around, like a structure, like building a house, you know? Like building, building a building, yeah? But, but still, what do you think about Chanel number five? Listen, I have nothing against anything. You know, yeah, I think but it's do, you like, do you like the smell? I never think? wore perfume in my entire life. Right. Chanel number no. 5 is not the worst. It's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it like that. I see. But there, are a lot of also, there are a lot of niche perfumes at the moment which try to be kind of conceptual. You know, but who would put dog shit on the skin? You know, and any perfume there is anyway dog shit. So why, you know, I mean, but I mean, it's... The whole world of smell is pretty perverse. What justify for washing your floor with the smell of Granny Smith? Isn't that perverse? Huh? Probably. I don't know. It is. Uh, Why don't we wash your floor with the smell of dog shit or asphalt or? <laughs> um, I have to. I have to confess that I'm not very sensitive to smells. Like okay. very often, people around me say, "Oh, it smells of this," and I'm always the last to catch it. So if you would like to train me, for example, yeah. to train my nose, how, how would you start? Where, what should I do in order to become more sophisticated in... in what in would you do if you couldn't see and couldn't hear? How would you find your partner, your food, your Strelka University, Strelka Institute, or me even? <laughs> how would you do it? 
<laughs> what what <laughs> organ would you what organ would you use? I don't know. I would probably ask someone for help. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't work. Come on, that's an easy solution. No way. Not accepted. Come on, they can have it. No, I mean it's 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 difficult to change. The earlier in life you can influence perception, the better. That's why I stress so much education and children. If you have ambition with your knowledge, place it where it makes sense. Yeah, which I think is in kindergarten, in schools, and and and, and absolutely. So Especially we shouldn't have used this kind of smell training into uh, yes, primary schools. Yes, I mean schools. you're born with a neutral nose. You're born with a neutral approach to smell. Yeah. The sooner life. Apart from rotten bodies, that huh? would. Apart from rotten bodies, this you wouldn't like. Yeah, but if that's you're a kid. not about the smell. It's mm. about the chemicals that mm. you know make you withdraw because you better do, otherwise you maybe die from poison mm. or whatever. No, but I mean, as humans, we are born with very alert senses, and uh, the sooner you can influence uh, humanity to take a smell serious beyond hedonic and science of smell is bad and good, like. It's interesting. Let's speak about it. Let's articulate something towards it, not just accept this is bad or good. That's a dream for marketing, that we just accept bad and good. You know what I mean? So if you get beyond the notion of bad and good and start to articulate, like in the project with Mexico City, you know, giving people ability to express what is pollution, you know, what is the air that surrounds you, what is the black clouds. It's not just some smells that are caused by the other, but the moment they are asked to articulate it in language, something happened, you know? So with kids, you know, who have no prejudices yet, yeah? Every smell moment, the first moment in life is the essential one, and that's the source for the rest of your life. So right. if the first one can get, one can get the right, you know, the left, the, the rest is, is easy, yeah? I think that my, maybe my last question would be about the potential of designing smellscapes mm -hmm. in the city, uh, well, for this square, in, in the building, in the room, or in a park, maybe, on the contrary. So how, how do we, can we do this, actually? Can you really? Smell archives. Yeah, to, yes. yeah and, and use them in the city wherever you want to yes, induce yes, fear or yes, yes, hope yes. or yes. happiness. Yeah, but that's what I did with the Museum of Military History. It's archived smell, kind of, yeah? And also with all the city projects, it's also archived. That all these smells exist in form of formula or already a solution, a slurry of a kind, belonging to different institutes or different institutions and, and universities like Harvard, or Mexico City as an archive. I'm working now at a, a big at the historical royal palaces in the UK, where we're building up smell archives, some architecture. I mean, looking into how through smell molecules you can find out maybe more about a site or a building than you normally would, yeah? So, um, yeah, so there are different uh, way of doing it, you know? Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to imagine a, a, a square in yeah. the city center. Yeah. So what can you do with this volume of air that we breathe in, inhale and exhale? Um, can we design a smell that can program people to act in a certain way or uh, be happy or love each other or or it's not But aren't possible. there enough smells out there? I think first we have to understand what is there before we start to manip manipulate. Yeah, of course. You know, it's not it's an like, empty spot. Eh? It's like you manipulate already the body, and now we start to manipulate the shopping malls. It's like extension of perfuming the body. We perfume the shop, we perfume the museum, we perfume the squares. I am more for amplifying what is there. You know, listen, we have it all. It's packed out there. It's amazing. Just start to look into it. Amplify what you think is there for purpose and try to understand why it's there, why it should be there, why it shouldn't be removed. Because it is important for that specific context to understand and to navigate and communicate and coordinate according to what you find out with your nose. The nose knows everything long before sight and hearing ever come into processing. Nose knows like this, two synopsis. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, I know. But in humans, this process happens subconsciously. Animals, consciously, and then eyes confirm what the nose knows. We enter a room, we smell, and then we just pretend we don't know, yeah? So the difference is with me, <laughs> I enter a room, I smell, and I don't speak, because I already know. So that's what I say, when you want to change, it changes fundamentally 
you as a human being become a whole again somehow, integrating all your senses for the quality of a better life, you know? It's like it's get, everything gets much cheaper. You don't have to buy perfume. You don't have to, die, you know, buy deodorant, detergent. Yeah, you can get clean, but you don't have to camouflage it. You know what I mean? And the same with the city, you know, the discrepancy of smell in all aspects of life is so extreme. How are you going to navigate, you know? If we remove all bad looking buildings, all sound or noise, the same way we move, remove all smells, how the body can balance, you know, in a yeah, healthy yeah, way. It's not that we remove everything, we just maybe add something very conscious. No, but smell wise, everything is removed. Right. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you very much for, for, this, for this fantastic <laughs> conversation. If you don't have any questions, I just would like to tell you that one of the two that I had was an old sneaker of David ba Beckham. Uh, that's the one that almost kills you like this. That's the, the strongest smell is David. So have you done all the smells? No. Okay. <laughs> I just, this is my guess because it's so. Yeah. <laughs> Now you know. It wasn't that. But the moment uh, you've got the word, you react. But before you didn't. No, it That's was just a, it was just a strong smell. If I call it Chanel number no. five, you said wow. <laughs> if I call it David Beckham sneaker, you said that. So no, be it's careful. Not an no, it's smell. I have to admit it. She just demonstrate my talk. Mm, yeah. that this is the status quo <laughs> of the yeah of, of 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 normal yeah. Yeah, but it's true. Nothing bad, nothing good. It's just no, no. the way I it have, is. Yeah, you know? it's a strong smell. But, but if not I had a child sitting one. here, <laughs> she'd give me more David Beckham, give me more garbage, <laughs> give me more cheese, give me more sweat. You know, give, go away with the roses, go away with the, you know, that is my point, you know. So focus attention, you know, where it's worth it, you know, that's. Right. On this optimistic <laughs> point, thank you very much. So we didn't get uh, any questions from the audience. Questions from the audience are still She's open. Tired of me already. <laughs> I have a question from the audience. But um, it has to do with um, those examples where you associated uh, smell with taste quite directly. There is the wine project, and there is another project. But um, uh, And uh, I wondered if you, uh, because the, uh, you have these luxury items, of course, which have very, very particular smells, whether they're perfumes or, in fact, wines, which are constructed. Of course, they're agricultural products. There's, but there is a kind of uh, uh, a particular kind of smell, taste combination, which is supposed to evoke uh, aspects of the land, or the terroir, for example. Um, in your uh, suggestion that smells are being removed from things. Do you think this is something that is also associated with food and mass-produced food? And is your project about smell perhaps also a project about other um, things associated, you know, this? Where, yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of different uh, smells and we have five directions of smell. Uh, um, uh, we have 100,000 different smells and we have five directions of taste. So the nose is so important for the processing of food and the enjoyment of, of eating without smelling, you know, it is all very, very tame and, and boring. Yes, of course, it's very important. I've done a lot with taste. I, I mean, limit what I can show here, but yes, yes. I worked a lot with uh, Ferran Adria, Heston Blumenthal, yes. And the um, molecular kitchen, the chemistry of cooking the importance of the senses and, you know, the joy of, of eating, you know, just not consuming for the purpose of consuming, but, yeah. I just, want, just one more brief question. Uh, I was very interested in the smells that you abstracted from cities, the Berlin yeah. smell. How do you make decisions about what the components of the smell might be? Um, depends on the purpose of the project. There are different purposes that are there are different purposes, different intentions with the projects. Like in the Midwest, was a diversity and segregation issue. In, uh, in Mexico City, it was about pollution and awareness. In, in Berlin, it was uh, 
2004, where certain neighborhoods didn't know much about each other, so it was awaking curiosity beyond the neighborhoods actually looked like, like North of Berlin is a very, very suburb per area. South of Berlin was full of, you know, primary, primary immigrants, and so like, that was a main intention to, to decontextualize city and challenge people to get curious about it. Yeah? And of course, I'm a one person decision here. Like, I don't pretend I'm objective. That is the freedom you have as a creative person. If I was in science, I would operate ob objective and do it differently. But, um, you know, if you walk around with your camera, you don't make photos of something as somebody else wants, you know? So I collect my smell because I think that is communicating my intention and that moment fits for the purpose. So it's like, of course, individual choice. If you did it, it would smell different. But the fact that I do it, I mean, process is for me more, more important than the product. And the context is half the work, you know? So where do I place my city? In the context of university, institute, back in the city, always I give feedback to the city, to the people, to the kids, to the schools. It's completely, it's a package. You don't invite me to Tel Aviv, otherwise you give me access to the university and to the primary schools. That's, that's in the contract, you know, always. Otherwise it's just showcasing whatever for the showcase of elitaire kind of purpose. I always, I, I want that connection, you know. That's why I also think this institute is so interesting, like the site-specific aspect of it, connecting to the city, doing research, you know, and topics that the city could be interested in adapting, you know? It's the future, for God's sake, you know? It's so fantastic. Give me a Strelka in Berlin, I will change the world. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Hooray. I'm happy that it happened in Moscow, not in London, you know? It will be so different, and I think here it's potential and beyond. I'm building up a smell lab in Shanghai. I had option to do it in New York and at, in Boston with Harvard. I said, no, I want to do it in China. I want to do it in the Middle East. I want to do it in East Europe. You know, it's completely different, you know. Curiosity, the passion is gone. And that's also with the senses and sensoric, you know, to get back passion, enthusiasm in people. How do you do it in education, you know? So I think a lot of topics we have to, to, to confront in a different way, you know? We have to get away from, look, oh, for God's sake, yeah. We should all become blind for, for a time. Yeah. Thank, thank but, you. you know, look at the Russian avant-garde, you know, the suprematism. That, that they all were not at all, you know, uh, uh, they didn't have problems, you know, with, with synesthesia. They all pretended they were synesthetic, you know? Scriabin, I did, an opera, I did a piece with Scriabin's composition for Salzburg Festival with Tokyo Philharmonic. We did the senses of smell, taste, sound, etc. I mean, these, these people knew what they were doing, you know? 